I'm trying to tell you, you play this side, that's what you're trying to do. Come on, Evan. Because I studied arithmetic at the Board of Education. Is that how I got that idea? Close. 
it's hard to do. And for the purpose of just getting I don't think they're going to go to the. I'm just still shooting this. It's like playing a left hand. Okay. 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 Okay, Matthew, what you're seeing here is Robert Sostry. He's the one with the reddish orange shorts. He's going to serve. His partner is Bill. And they're playing Eddie Patrici and Billy Maggio. Now, the front team is very steady. They don't make very many mistakes. Billy, whose back is to you right now, he has a very effective left hand. He doesn't want to be a showman. All he wants to do is make sure he doesn't miss and keep the other team off balance. The other team, however, Eddie Patrici and Billy, they're both fiery players. They love to run and jump and swing away. But since they're both basically singles players, it makes it pretty hard for them to coordinate. Eddie Patrici on that left side will be the dominant force. If anything's going to happen in this game, it's going to be Patrici. The key is going to be Billy on this side, not missing. They find him and he starts to miss, then that team is going to be in trouble. Score is 1-3. It's going to be a 21-point game. And the winner of this game will go into the third slot in the semifinals. We're going to try and play the whole tournament today. They're going to keep volleying back and forth here, Matthew. This is known as the feeling out part of the game. It's very early now, so nothing dramatic is going to happen. One team may take a four or five point lead, but it won't be very meaningful because the other team typically fights back. So what we're going to do is take a little break here. The score is six playing twelve. Six playing twelve. And believe it or not, this is still the feeling out process. But I want you to look at one thing. Eddie Patrici in the red. I want you to look at his back when he turns around. What he did was go in low to scoop up a shot, and he actually picked up all the residue of uh, rain that hit here, and he's got mud on his back. It looks like a brand new Batman outfit. They're still basically all playing very conservatively. As you can see, they're in one straight line, right on the short line. At one point, somebody's going to back up, change the speed of the ball, and then drop it in front of his own partner. That will be the technique. But they're all still basically very conservative. They put up 50 bucks a team. The first prize is 500. So they don't want to make any mistakes. And when you don't make any mistakes, you wind up just pounding the ball back and forth. But this has to break open. They just can't last this long pounding the ball. Somebody on one team is going to have to do that. It's either going to be Eddie Patrici in the red, or it's going to be Robert Sastry in the, the lighter colored red. Billy on the right side is playing a very conservative game, which he should. He's trying to not to make any errors. Billy Maggio in the gray shorts out back, being a singles player, he feels like he's being boxed out of the play. He wants to play singles, and he's playing a subservient role to Eddie Patrici. Now, unless Patrici gets out of the conservative mode himself and starts going for shots as he just did, he's going to find himself on the short end of this game. Billy is serving left-handed. He has a little trouble with his right shoulder, but he's still keeping the ball in play. He's very alert. He's watching every ball, and he's making sure he doesn't error. He can blunder by going for a shot, and that will be a big mistake at this point. He's got to keep the team together. 
Sastry, unfortunately, is not per se a shot maker. He's basically a guy who keeps the ball in play and doesn't make many errors also. But it's going to come down to the nitty gritty. They're going to sense that if one team doesn't take a chance, they're going to wind up on the short end. This is the longest point of the game that it's gone, where everybody is more or less still playing conservatively and not trying to figure out a game pattern. They're going to line up again on the short line, side by side, keep pounding the ball back and forth. Something has to give. I would continue to put my money on Billy and on Robert Sastry because Eddie Patrici, he's used up a lot of energy and Billy Maggio is boxed in on this right side. Well, we're into a timeout now and we'll be right back. Determination in the faces of these players. Eddie Patrici is trying to pump up his opponent, his partner Billy Maggio. Patrici's shoulder has grime on it, it's got cuts on it, and the referee just asked him to watch his language. To watch his language after yeah. he said fuck you? Yeah. He says to watch his language. I, I don't think it's really appropriate to tell him that at this juncture. And I think if you do tell him, you don't make a speech about it. You go over to him and tell him privately. Say, hey, look, take it easy. But you can see sheer determination in everybody's eyes. Billy went for a shot. I don't think he intended it. Judging by his the way his body was positioned and his hand came forward, I don't think he intended that shot, but it went in for a kill. I don't think he wanted to take a chance on it. This is the only game where you can say fuck you to a referee in the first. Billy shouldn't have taken that shot, actually, but he got away with it. Had he missed it, it just puts more pressure on their team to score. <laughs> It's like they're trying to find him. See, the only time I would allow him to go for a shot is if he was six points ahead. This is still critical. It's only a 21-point game. So he can't really afford to make a mistake. He got away with one kill shot, but he's got to be extremely careful. And you see, Sastry is uh, not going for shots either. And that's detrimental to the team. He seems very relaxed, Sastry. He doesn't seem to be worried about anything. He's not setting up a game plan. The score at this juncture, our game plan should have already been established. My brother Rossi would have been warmed up at this time, and he would have fired the ball to the long line, gone in and rolled them out on the, on the return. Rossi was not doing that. He was a very conservative man. Let's try and see what the score is, as Ali tells us what the score is. He's not saying that. I think he said the score was 14-9, but it might have also been 14-5, I don't know. playing some very peculiar rules here today. No story. In the usual, in the usual big ball game, if the uh, serving side creates a block or the other side creates a block, you usually get two serves. They're playing here today the national hardball rule. Whereas if the serving side creates the block, he gets up with one full. That was a beautiful shot. That, that really should not have happened to have passed them both in the middle. Because both of the teams are playing basically in the middle. And for whatever reason, they were just like three feet off that center point and Sastry was able to hit it through the middle. You see, he's not setting up a pattern. He's just content to keep banging the ball. He got away with one through the center, but this is really not productive. That was a good shot by Bill. I'll call one Billy and I'll call the uh, shorter man in the gray shorts, Bill. Billy in the gray shorts in the back, Billy with the ponytail. This is really strange. 21 point game, we're getting down to the nitty gritty. No firm pattern has as yet been established. This is really peculiar. It's like they, they don't know what the score is and they're just hitting the ball in a game. Beautiful, Beautiful shot. Beautiful, baby. Beautiful shot. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful.
You notice, Matthew, nobody is hitting the ball to the long line, pushing the players off balance, and then going in, killing it in front of his own partner. A critical thing has just happened. The back team switched sides, and they were argumentative about it, which didn't help. Patrice is very uh, emotional, so he came in on that shot. He's still talking to himself, and he just swung at the ball and missed it, which he never usually misses. A pattern is now being established, not play-wise, but psychologically. Now Billy, with the ponytail, is trying to pump up his opponent. There's been a little bit of distress in, with the back team, and it's not that he, any team is doing great stuff physically with the ball. It's just the emotions now. All of a sudden, he went for a shot where he had a, a shot that he could have hit at Patrice's legs. And even if the ball would have been lowered, Patrice would have been there and probably would have reclaimed it anyway. Because that's what he's best at. You see how they're basically gravitating to the center again? This is amazing. And I think Sastri didn't intend that drop shot away with the ball, but he got away with it. They seem to just be pounding away, and they're content with it. Isn't this typical playground handball doubles of the B level as we see it so many times? That's correct. But as you're seeing now, this is for a berth in the semifinals. This is supposed to be a level higher than the typical, but it isn't. Nobody wants to go for the shot, and any championship team should be going for the shot for two reasons. One, you establish your turf. Secondly, you don't use as much energy in, in winning the game. They're pounding, pounding, pounding here. You think they're going to be able to continue that same play in the semis? And if they make the finals, do the same thing? It doesn't work that way. Again, he miscued. He miscued, and he got away with the kill shot, which is really extraordinary. They seem to be keeping the ball away from Sashley. It's like four gladiators with uh, whatever weapons they have just pounding at each other and if somebody falls, somebody falls. It's like two heavyweights who are both hitters. No defense at all. They just go in there and swing away and if one guy goes down, that's it. That's what this uh, is a parallel to. Can't get a fix on the score. He's rinsing it through his mustache, unfortunately. Who missed that one? Sasha? Oh, see, now the score is 11 18. The back team can afford to be somewhat conservative. But the front team, I don't on, think, uh, even though Billy rolled that, I don't think it's going to be too much of a. He just doesn't have enough shots. You see that? Just doesn't have enough shots. He made one kill shot and looked there back in the volley again, which has given Sastri and Billy the 18 points. Joe, it's funny. Fuck! Fucking guy! That was beautiful. That was beautiful. If it's a backswing, you have to pull it right away. The action was rather rapid there. It was very difficult to make a play. Allie, the referee, is behind him. He can't look through their bodies and see that there's any contact. That's why the rule is, if a man makes a backswing contact, he pulls it right away. If he doesn't call it, he doesn't get the benefit of a good shot, and he gets the destruction aspect of a bad shot. That's the reason for the rule. The referee in the back cannot see three bodies. Therefore, the player, and that's the only call the player makes. And keep in mind, I am not going to get involved in this. There's a full moon. Temperatures were pretty high today. Happily, the clouds came out to cool it off a bit. This would have been much more uh, egregious behavior had the sun been baking down on their brains for two or three hours. See? Hit the floor. You see how it fell back in the same pattern? Billy had one serve to the long line, rolled it out, and it fell precisely back into the same pattern. Now Patrice is going to look for an opportunity. 
If only one man would back up for a second, let the ball drop, and then pick his shot, he could master these teams. He could master these teams, but they're falling into the same pattern. Pound and pound until somebody misses. It's a very simple proposition. The team in the back, I mentioned, being both individual singles players, can't get their act together as a doubles team. The team in front, because of Billy with the ponytail's right shoulder hurting, he doesn't want to be aggressive. He knows he can't miss, so he's doing a superb job helping Robert Sastry. Sastry is content now not to go for the shots because with their strategy, they've gotten the lead and they're holding it. But if the back team makes a comeback, then Sastry's gonna have to rearrange. You see, he shouldn't have lowered that shot. You pay the price when you lower the ball with these guys. They're standing at the short line to begin with. If you lower the ball, they have enough reflex to, to re-kill your shot. And the, the, the second problem is that the leading team can make it. They could just say, all I have to do is keep the ball in play and win. That doesn't happen that way either. There's a certain limit to that because the back team does not want to lose. They're going to give it everything they have. And if the front team were to let up almost, almost momentarily, then the trend could go back the other way. Front team not making any mistakes. They're holding it all together. If he had shot, it would have been a perfect opportunity for Sashi to back up and lower the ball. But he figures, they got the lead, they got the serve, why do it? There's no reason to do it. Most guys want to show off, they want to play the crowd, and they would go for a shot like that. But he's a very crafty player, Sashi. He won the Budweiser paddles five out of six years while still a very young man. The reason he won it was because of his exquisite control. He's now bringing that control into this game. Just look at the concentration of his eyes. He's wearing contacts, I understand, which makes it a little more pronounced. But he's got that concentration from way back. Bill is pumping him up a bit, which is very influential at this point. He doesn't want him to let up and assume they have the lead. I know all you have to do is waltz across the finish line. Nice try. That was a nice try by Billy. But to no avail. Well, I call that one. We got another semifinals coming on now. And it should be... Uh, it should be Derso and Spitak. Yeah, this is very important. You get in the middle. Of the okay, look. Okay, you ready? Okay. I don't usually smile. I'm Ruby Obert, and this is a very proud moment for me. The beautiful people you're seeing in front of you, not necessarily me, have made history for West Fifth Street. Since the formation of the national tournaments, only 22 people have gone into the illustrious Hall of Fame. Two of those people are from West Fifth Street, and they're here today. One is me, and the other is this great champion for many, many, many years, Steve Sandler. He holds the record number of one world championships in this great sport. He and I represent West Fifth Street, and we're in the Hall of Fame. This beautiful person you see between us is my daughter, and she won the prestigious Ford Modeling Agency Supermodel of the World Contest in the New York area, 2,000 entries, and you're looking now at number one. Matthew Paris, our photographer, will now ask Erica a question, and then he will proceed to ask Steve Sandler a question. Since we've been asking many questions in the past, he won't ask me a question. Uh, uh, is, it, is it very hard, Erica, to be beautiful? Isn't it, isn't it awful to const... I mean, the incredible burden of... of, of uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I would not want to be as beautiful as, as you are because, you know, you can't be anonymous. Isn't it awful to be beautiful? I mean, I think I'm beautiful on the inside, and that's not a burden. You're picking that up? You're speaking. Well, you know, but on the other hand, everybody notices you. It's, it's, a, it's an artificial life. 
isn't it? I mean, you know, isn't there a certain amount of pain? I mean, I can remember when I was young and good looking, it was about a thousand years ago, and I remember I felt it was a burden. I couldn't wait to get old. Steve. How do you feel? I couldn't wait to get old. How do you feel? I feel that that if people look at you because of your um, outward appearance, you know, and they pay more attention to you because of that, then you can you can do more positive things that other people want to get to you because they don't get noticed as much. You know, if you get attention because you look good, then you have a good inside and you can do positive things. Then I think it's positive. So it's an opportunity. If you're by your your physical beauty or whatever, then it's negative. I have a, a question for Steve. Um, other than, so other than having a thrill of a lifetime being next to the supermodel, Steve, and being at West Fifth Street, what was your greatest handball thrill down at West Fifth Street? Yeah. I saw him play a final against your brother. Terrific game. I might, without thinking too clear, you know, thinking it really out, I might initially think that uh, when I played Paul, that rematch, uh -huh. you know, the tournament, was yeah. that guy that, you know, that dispute about who uh -huh. about that Paul, which was, you know, which was, I think, probably a good reason, legitimate reason for playing the match over. Wow. I might consider that my biggest thrill, but... After I think it out, I really, I, 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 I consider that my second biggest thrill, you know, uh -huh. playing the game over winning. You what's your biggest what's your biggest thrill in handball? That, um, Other than the Hall of Fame, obviously. You said down to West Fifth Street. But no, I'm saying going from West Fifth beyond that now to your tournament career, what's the next highlight? Yeah. You're referring to specific game, aren't you? Sure. Well, the time Danny Flicks and I played Howie and Kenny and I lost twenty five five and I got my and I played Howie and Kenny myself. And Kenny put out Kenny Serving and I and I killed him. I would consider that, you know, like so that was a doubles game, even though your expertise is uh, singles. Okay, let, let, let's just backtrack one second. As I understand it, you got most of your basic handball skills at Lincoln Terrace Park, and then on to Avenue P. It was Avenue P all the time? But didn't you see the greats of old, like Mo Ornstein and Vic Hershkowitz play? That was at Avenue P. Okay, what you learned at Avenue P to develop your skill did you enhance those skills in any way at West Fifth Street, or did you already reach a plateau where there was nothing new to learn? Well, from playing with Maui and Vic, that's playing against you and your brothers is really how I got better. Uh -huh. That's it, period. So, playing with better players. So basically, so basically what you're saying is to be a champ, you have to play great players, you have to play a lot of players, you can't be located and only, you have to play tournaments, and that's what brings out the great ones. You have to play with better players. Uh -huh. When I was younger, the better players were you and your brothers, and Bowie and Vic, well, of course, but those, Bowie and Vic, I played, you know, the money games, not tournaments. And uh, Howie and Kevin were the How did the fact that you used to play a lot of games with only your left hand playing two guys at once, how did that Air to your championship status when you went on into tournaments. Was that a great help to you? Not to miss with the left, keep the ball back, tie your opponents. Is that basically it? I think how, how it really it helped me in one way. I don't think it really helped me physically. I think it just playing all those tough games well, it made my left better, but I don't think it made a difference how my left being better playing against, not to sound like a record, you and your brothers. And, but it made me mentally tough. Really games. That's an interesting yeah. comment because. It physically, it made that much of a difference. It was yeah. just the mental toughness. That's an interesting question. I'll tell you why. Because in most great matches, the obvious thing to do is is to play the opponent's weakness. So I can only think about if you develop that great left hand, that would minimize your opponent's ability well, to penetrate. Made me a better defensive player. Okay. It made me much stronger. Like I said, mentally, you made this because the games are so hard that I just wanted to win the points with your one hand. You made you work so hard that when you play the regular game, it was a lot easier on your brain, at least in my brain, to, you know, compete. You know? And it's true what you said, it made you much stronger on that side of the court, but not the way I swung that, like you swung, you know, an easy way. Yeah. It made me better defensively, not, you know, not so much offensively. Now, as I understand it, you were so great in your era that you had to play lesser players 
under certain circumstances. For instance, I remember your opponent could hit the ball to two walls and you could only return it to one. I remember you had to wear high hip boots and a heavy uh, raincoat. I remember one time you had to hold a radio to your ear, and I remember another time. I didn't have to hold it, I had a bed. I know, that's why you held a radio to your ear. I had an umbrella for my head. And there was another time you held a chair in your hand. Which was the craziest game in your mind that you had to submit to in those games? Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Right, the craziest game I ever played was, I played Crazy Donny. Oh, I guess I played Abe, it was Oh, Crazy Abe. I played him hopping. I had to stay on one left. Wow. What, wasn't there also a game that you had to stay on the outside of the court, on the sidelines, and then back at the long line to play? The guy has to go over the short line. So he had to hit it to the... That isn't really that hard. That's very interesting. No, but the hardest game is to play is playing on one floor, just playing on one leg. He had to quit. He couldn't feel his leg anymore. That's right. I mean, could you change legs and hop on the other for a while? Okay, I just have another question for you. It'll be a short one. You're a champion in one wall, and you're also familiar with three wall and four wall. Uh, what in your mind do you think is the basic ingredient for a one wall champion to be successful, say, in three and in four wall? What do you think is that key element, other than playing on those courts and trying to come along? Assuming that you took this great athletic talent that you possess and you went into three wall and four wall, what do you think is the key to make you successful? Is it to take the ball off the wall on the fly? What is it? To make a pl any play so what will be the most successful pattern that you could use in order to be successful in three and four wall, those alien games? Myself or anybody? You, as a champion one waller. Practice and practice and practice and learn the skills. Four wall skills have nothing to do with one. Okay. You couldn't take your one wall skills and, and totally, I mean, you could totally use them, but it wouldn't make you anywhere near a champion four wall player because they're playing Jimmy. Okay. Be more true than that. Yeah, but I understand you played Jimmy in one wall and beat him. He played you in four wall and he beat you. Right. So that, to my mind, is a standoff. Yeah, but it proves that the games are so different. Exactly. Exactly. And both of us are national champions. It means that the games have very little to do with one Very good. All right. So now we've covered one wall and we've covered four wall. Now we'll concentrate on three wall. Since there isn't a three wall facility in this area except in Bayonne, New Jersey, and it's too big for the 2040, now not having an opportunity to play, and now you say, I think I'll enter that three wall tournament with your athletic skills. What do you think will be the main thrust of your play in order to win now? Three wall, as far as I'm concerned, is basically a one wall game. Okay. It's really 80% one wall. What so you would serve low? Would you serve low? I don't, I don't think serving is, t is super important in one three wall. Being in super shape is important. Very so good. You can all the punishment that you have to take day after day. Exactly. You know? I don't think you have to be, uh, there's no, you know, being in super shape is the most important thing. And most of the four wall players, to be in better shape than the one wall players. And that's a, that's, that's the, probably their only advantage that they have. Do you in your mind, though, perceive that in order for a one wall player to be great in three wall, he has to develop overhand shots in order to be effective? Yes or no? Yeah, well, but a one wall player normally have a good overhand swing. I mean, up until recently, not to be knocking the current guys, okay. they haven't, in my you know, opinion, had this. They didn't. They lost the opportunity to play with real good players, and not to be, you know, being sound, you know, just saying it the way it is. And that's a bit. It's not their fault, but they, the fellas that play played now, the champions, Joe and Albert, and them, uh -huh. didn't have the opportunity to play with better players. So. <laughs> Like Harold Ham for Marty Cushman with the overhand serves, pushing you around. Me and your brothers and Vic and Moe and all, you know, Vic and Jimmy and more. But prior to that, all the people that won three more corners were all one more players. A four more player couldn't win. Good point. And I wasn't even a champion three more player, and I wasn't in good shape, and I always got to the quarterfinals. Beautiful. With so little practice, too. Yeah. It's a question of being in good shape, as far as I'm concerned. Now, having played for how many years? About. 35 years. Summing up in your own mind about all this activity in the sport that we both love, what is the main thing that comes to your mind that gave you the most pleasure in all the years that you played this great game? I like to have a, I like to have a good 
like the idea of having a lot of people watch the playing games. You know, that was a challenge of playing against what I consider better players than myself. Uh -huh. And it was a lot of fans of those days. Uh -huh. Ten times. Beautiful. Now, Very that good. Was my reason for playing. Now, personally, I'm having more fun now than I ever did in my life. Getting, are you having? We're getting along better. Uh, are are you having more? <laughs> are you having more fun yeah, sure. than ever before? <laughs> Okay. Steve, thanks so much. You're just great to be with us. Thanks so much, Steve. He won with his opposite oh, I hand. I know. One Left hand. hand. I know. Left hand. His opposite. And what did Jacobs use Two when he played four? Yeah. When he played no, no, four, no, no, four no, no, what did Jacobs no, no, no. use? Okay, he used his left also. Okay, what we got to do... Okay. Okay, we're in the early part of this uh, first of two semifinal games. One semifinal is going on right here on Court One at West Fifth Street, and behind me, simultaneously, we have the other semifinals with the great Emmett and the great Buddy Gant. I don't think on paper that they're going to have much problem beating the other semifinal team, but you never know. What we're looking at here is two great, great competitors, not only in hardball, but also in the softball, not only in doubles, but also in singles. The man serving, Paul Provivi, a tremendous player, a tremendous champion, great reflexes. The same with Eddie Golden, his partner in the dark shirt. Two fabulous players who do what they do so well. The team they're playing is Robert Sastry, who managed to make the semifinals, and also his partner, Billy Abelafia. Billy is having trouble with his right shoulder, so as you notice, he's doing all his work with his left hand. He's trying not to make errors here, but I have to think through here. Sastry is playing a very conservative game. The team they're playing are very fiery, and they go for the shots, look for the opportunities. So I give a slight edge to this front team now. Even though they're both tremendous singles players and you would suspect that they couldn't get together in a doubles match, they've been playing a lot of doubles together. Now watch the positioning here. Typically, the, all four players line up at the short line. They, they seem to congregate around that central area. But I think you're going to see something different this game. I think you're going to see not only Eddie Golden going for angle shots, you're also going to see Paul Previtti going for angle shots. That's going to open this game wide open. It's going to put a lot of pressure on Billy here, serving with his left hand. But he does so well, Billy. He pushes the ball to the long line, keeps the guys off balance. But as you notice, Sastry is not going for the shots. He's just pounding. That could be dangerous. See, there was an attempt by Eddie Golden for the shot. It's still early in the game, so... This is supposed to be the feeling out process, but they're actually trying to establish a pattern here. The back team, very aggressive. They want to get on the scoreboard early. We got two great referees here. The man in the red hat, Morris Levitsky. We call him the Dean of Referees. He just won the prestigious Robert Kendler Award from the United States Handball Association for all his years for the love of the sport. We put him in here as an icon. He not only is an excellent referee, but he's also a stable part of West Fish Street. People come down just to see Morris Levitsky. He's a minor god. He's a demigod. He used to be a demitas. <laughs> you see how the pa a different pattern is going here? Billy is keeping the ball in play. That's okay. Billy's keeping the ball in play. But there's fire in the eye of Golden, Praviti, and Sastri. You're going to see tremendous fireworks here in a few minutes. I think in order to win this particular match, it's going to be a contest about who goes for the shot and makes it. Both playing. You see how we went for that shot? He didn't just go for that. He actually hit the ball three times in the volley, setting it up. That's the real difference between this game and the games we've seen before. They're actually looking for the opportunity by using two previous shots to set up the definitive shot. They must go for the shots if they plan to win. I think the back team has that more in mind than the front team. 
front team has won their two matches by playing very conservatively. I think they sense now that they're going to have to do more than that. Isasri is supposed to be the dominant player over there, the shot maker, because Billy is keeping the ball in play, which is all he can do. This is a beautiful matchup, and I think you're going to see great fireworks here. Watch Billy's face. Look at his eyes. Even when he's not hitting the ball, he's got his eye on it. He's ready to move. He's ready to protect. He knows he's at a disadvantage. He can only play defensively. I hope this little bit of pitter patter goes past us. We've been lucky so far. The referee is checking out the condition of the court. There's a lot of heat in the ground. It'll evaporate quickly if the raindrops don't continue. The center part of the court still looks dry because that's where the players have been moving. It's the forecourt. All right, I don't think the players want to take a chance hurting themselves. They'll only take a few minutes. Erica, we'll take Erica a few seconds here. Leave it on there, Romatic. I introduce you to Emmett Fitzpatrick. He is the chief coordinator and the brainchild of this tournament. What we thought was going to start out as a very small tournament has turned out to be one of the biggest events that we've had at West Fifth Street since the Nationals. Emmett has coordinated the whole thing. There's a $50 entry fee per team. He's going to tell you a little bit more about his thoughts, what goes through his mind to put through such a fabulous tournament. Emmett Fitzpatrick. All right, Emmett. Well, the first thing is, as a player and as a producer, is there a kind of a double role that is slightly uncomfortable for you sometimes to be uh, the maker of the tournament and the star of the tournament at the same time? Yeah, when I have two teams disagree, then we don't have the right referees, you know, that start up a lot of trouble. I have heard you handle that trouble in a very decisive way. You know, you've said, if the referee makes the call, that's, that's it. That's it, that's stand. Yeah, and it seems to me that you've had a lot of experiences in, in handling a lot of pretty difficult situations, haven't you? Yeah. I think I can answer that, Matthew. Just look at the physique on this guy. Oh, I Would you want to question any of the him. calls he makes? I, I could take this. Guy. He's not only a great athlete, he's a fine gentleman, and because he has so much respect, when he speaks as the chief referee to make a call, everybody listens. All right, but at the same time, Emmett, here you are, you know, you probably are one of the best five or, or ten blue ball players in the city of the world, who knows? And at the same time, you know, you're producing, it's two roles. Have you, have you got two sides of your personality for each of the roles? I mean, on, on the one hand, as, as an athlete, you know, you've got to be extremely focused and ferocious. On the other hand, you have to be very fair and judicious and, and detached. Yeah. How do you keep that all together? How do you do? I'm a nice guy. I just call what I see, you know, and that's it. All right. But on the court, I see you very focused. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and mentally, you know, you're absolutely attuned to the game, you know, like on a straight line, right? Yeah. Isn't that a different part of you? I mean, I mean, how nice a guy can you be, really, if, if, if you want to destroy an opponent? You know, let me ask you that. Well, I just play to win. I don't try to destroy nobody. A win is a win. You know, a lot of people hurt themselves for trying to destroy somebody, you know? Now, I noticed your style is essentially, if you're playing hard, you've got a real straight-up style. And if you get a little bored, you've got these uh, soft little curling shots. It, at the time that we see those uh, those uh, soft spinning shots from you, is, is that a sign that your mind isn't on the game anymore? I'm tied. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Emmett, uh, Robert Sastry and, and his partner Billy are now playing Paul Previtti and Eddie Golden. At this particular moment in time, who do you think you'll be meeting in the finals? Golden and Paul. And what, what do you think the score will be? It'll be close, like 21-18. Do you think that's because Robert Sastry is playing too conservatively? Yes. And you think the fire between Golden and Providi, they'll start going for shots and that'll make the difference to break it open. Yeah. Okay, now having said that, 
facing Golden and Pravidi in the final, what will be your game plan? I won't tell him, but I wanted to know what you think your game plan will be. Play the opposite hand. Uh-huh. That's it. But they have four opposite hands. <laughs> Equally strong. Play the opposite hand, wait for my setup, and marry. So you're going to be the determining factor of this whole ball of wax. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Emmett, very good, Emmett. we got to get back to the game. I'll question Emmett. Okay. Um, how do you play a situation of deference with a couple of singles players like yourself and Buddy Gant, who are tremendous players at singles, how do you work out who's going to take what if your instinct is always to take everything? Because we're now at late Saturday afternoon. I'm sure the people who have left didn't want to really miss this game. I suspect that they had dinner engagements and theater engagements, but we still have the hardcore group here that loves handball. <laughs> the score is 9-6, Paul Pravidi is serving. The question to be answered is, with this little bit of rain delay, who will warm up faster to get right into the action? Because this is a 21-point game, it's going to be critical who strikes the blow with enough ferocity to perhaps keep a lead. A moment ago, Billy hit a shot with his left hand and killed it. That may not necessarily have been so good because he should really keep the ball in play. However, Paul Pravidi just missed, missed the shot with his left hand, giving Billy and Robert Sastry to serve. Sastry still has fire in his eyes. Look at his eyes. He looks like he wants to blast that ball past everybody. I don't think it's going to be enough. Somebody is going to have to go for shots. And again, Billy, Robert Sastry's posture, path partner, made the kill shot. Notice he's a right hand, but he's serving with his left hand. He's had a little trouble with his right shoulder, but he keeps that ball in play, makes very few mistakes, and when he sees an opportunity, he drops it down just like that. In theory, he's not supposed to do that, but he's got the control, he had the shot, he had his opponent blocked out. Because he's supposed to be the man who keeps the ball in play, doesn't take chances. If he should happen to miss a few kill shots, he puts more pressure on Sastry to perform. Sastry has not yet performed the way he's supposed to. He's supposed to step back, let the ball drop, and drop it in front of his partner, who will be a legal pick in front of Eddie Golden. The game is getting now to almost a crisis stage. The back team is worried that they had this letdown because of the rain delay. They're a little unsure about bringing their firepower together. They're both determined to do it. Sastry is playing the conservative place again by keeping the ball in play. But as you saw, Eddie Golden hit the kill shot. It's going to be the back team that's going to have to kill, aim it to the center, get them off balance, and then go for the corners. If they continue to play the center off only, then they're going to be in for some rough sledding. They must go for the shots, they must go for the corners to separate Sastry and Billy from that center. Billy is back to playing errorless ball. He's also looking for another opportunity to put the ball away. Sastry had a right, uh, Sastry had a left corner kill shot, and what did he do? He put the ball back in play. He is not yet taking the chance. I don't know how far you can carry that game plan. They're ahead by four points. I suspect if they come to within two points of the back team, he'll have to change. But now, playing his game, he's still getting the points. Keep in mind, the team in the back, both singles players, they like to be aggressive. Doubles is a game of partnership. When they warm up, they'll do it very well. But with the rain delay, they still have to find their way back to that to tempo. There's the first shot Sastry took. He dropped it in front of himself. That's because he had a five-point lead. That made it a six-point lead. He plays conservatively till he gets the lead, then he does whatever he has to. If he falls back in the score and they come close, he goes back to his original game plan. Look at Billy's eyes. He's concentrating. He's always ready to return that ball. Very important in doubles. I played with players. I do all the work. They'd stand there and just watch. And then the team would hit a ball to them and they'd still be standing there watching. Even if you're not in the play, you must be alert and moving. <laughs> See, this is phase two of the game. He played conservatively, got the lead, 
And now at will, he's going to do what he wants. If the other team makes a comeback, then he'll revert back to his conservative play. Isn't that beautiful? Up until this point, he didn't think it was necessary to go for the shot. Once he took the lead, he dramatically has shown them that he means business. He doesn't seem to use his wrist very much. Either. That's because he's a champion paddleball player. So he's thinking more paddle. That's correct. He's so sharp and bringing the balls back, it's basically from paddles. Look at that magnificent play. Instead of Paul putting it in the left corner when he had Sastri all the way out, for some reason he put it in Billy's corner. But I've never missed a shot from over here, as you well know. Now keep in mind, everybody is keeping the ball waist high and lower. They're hitting the ball with basically the same amount of speed. One team, if they have the skill, could actually break the game over by using overhand serves to the long line and then attacking and dropping the ball down. See, they're all still powering the ball, basically. Now watch what happens. Sastri in the back will not go for the kill. He will still play the conservative game until the front team scores too many. If he senses that, see? He got him by playing his game plan. He got the, the guy out. Now he's going to do the same thing with this man. The front team has to be aggressive, has to go for shots. That's what Paul wants to do. That was a magnificent shot right through the center. That was a beauty. It shows the intensity which these men are playing. They don't want to lose, they want to win. Not only for the prize money, but also for the pride. The guys who come out first here, and ultimately if they win the tournament, they will be very much respected in the game of handball around the city. And if we get this on cable and then ultimately on national TV, these will be the superstars that we hope to see. This is where it all begins. We plant the seeds here on a modest basis, Thanks to the work of Matthew Paris, getting it on cable, we move on from there. Look at the intensity with which Paul Providi is hitting that ball. He's got his heart and soul in this game. That was a good bounce, good pickup. They're so expert that that would have been dead for anybody else. Look how the intensity is increasing. Beautiful. Even though the back team didn't win that volley and the front team gained the serve, what did happen in that long volley, the back team is finally congealed. They're coming together as a team, and heaven knows what can happen from here. The point of the matter is, with the front team on that short line, they control the court. You can only do your damage, basically, if you serve and take advantage of it. But that back team is now glued, they're coalesced in their game plan. That long volley allowed them to warm up and actually come together as a team. Let's see what happens. And it was basically Paul, Paul Providi who did it. By that intense play and that resounding shocker through the middle. I don't think that they lost their energy by that long volley. Sometimes that happens for a spot. Eddie Golden seems to have let up a little bit. He's not hitting the ball to the right place. See, what happened is the front team put enormous pressure on them, and they scored points doing it. Eddie will tend to revert back to a singles man. Look, you watch him. He's bouncing around. He's watching. But look where his hands are. His hands are almost by his knees. you gotta be, you got to be a lot more ready than that. It was a faux pas, it was actually a block ball, but Eddie didn't call it. He had a clear block on him, but he's disoriented now. Robert Sosfi just told Billy that he's got to go for the angle. I don't agree with that at all. They have the lead. The basic game plan was to just, when they're serving, to keep the ball in play. The pressure is on the back team to make shots. And so I think he should really continue with the more conservative plan, unless it's a clear attempt at a winner. He should keep the winners going if he can. But I don't think he should tell his partner to, to angle the ball. Billy's job is to keep the ball in play, and he should continue to keep the ball in play. 
Yeah, you want to shut it? For okay, we have a timeout now. We're going to replenish the battery. Hello, young man. Congratulations to you. That's wonderful. Take care of yourself. And good luck. What's up, guy? How are you doing? Hello, you so. Okay, we're back in the action. Semi-finals. Buddy Gant and Emmett have already gotten into the finals. On paper, they're the favorites. But anything can happen at this level of play. The score is 19-9, favor the front team. This is really remarkable. I thought Pravidi and Golden would really come together earlier, but I think the rain delay didn't help them. The rain delay definitely didn't help them. They warmed up, got started, then they had to stop. Got warmed up, started, and had to stop again. This is a beautiful match. You have an 80% conservative back team with a 20% firepower, and you have a 100% front team with 100% firepower. That's a potent combination. Anything can happen at any time. It could be a questionable call. It could be a bumping of one player by the other. Anything could upset the trend that we're now watching. How do you deal with a 9 main team game? Do you play conservatively? Or do you try a lot of things that haven't got a, a good percentage and hope that you're right here? Well, the theory in handball is don't continue a losing game. The front team thinks they have to score heavily in order to win. That's true. But you can only score at one point at a time. By just being aggressive and pounding and hoping for the best is not enough. They both correctly did the right thing. They both tried for a kill shot. They're trying to change a losing game. They went for the shot, didn't make it. Before this, they were not going for the shot. They were losing points. That's why the score is 19-9. Paul is trying to take the bull by the horns. He'll come up short because the front team will continue to blast that bull. And Paul doesn't have the skill to back up and, and place a ball in front of his partner for a pick. You see, you don't need ultimate power to blast the ball for a kill or for a pick. If you use your partner properly as a, a pick, as in basketball, you can do more. See, he's not hitting the ball correctly. Again, he didn't hit it correctly. You either pound it at the man's stomach or at his weak foot. You put it at his weak instep. You see, pounding the ball at him like that was right to his hand. It's better to hit a bounce shot at his feet. Even better than that, earlier in the game would have been lofting shots over the head to change the speed of the ball to get their timing off. And the game is over 21-9. It was a fine game, a fine match. Sastri and his partner Billy, they just played a wonderful game plan. They did what they had to do. When they took the lead, then they started getting aggressive to add to their lead. And that was beautiful. I go like this, wave. I think she's hot here. Okay. What is this with your daughter? Do you want to make a mod model out of it? He just likes beautiful women. Don't daughter worry. Is a model. Yeah. And you know she won the supermodel of the world contest in the New York area two years ago. 2,000 entries. She was number one. Hey, she's still modeling? Hey, yo, you know you've been better at standing on this yeah. camera? She's not going. Since they're not playing on this court. Good. She wasn't if you move in the middle, you get a better view. No, you don't. you don't. You have to move the camera too fast. He's got to be going back and forth. This way, you, it's more important to see the Can reaction you see right of their faces. You see right here? No, this is better because we got the whole, this pans the whole court. If you're over here, you get less. This allows you to get a whole picture just want to get the plate. with little movement. Yeah, the ball will come to them and you see their faces, the reactions. So what if, what if he was in the back? Way back. What is that? If you were in the back, how would you feel? It's not bad, but you got to... The serve was won by Emmett Fitzpatrick and his ever cool partner, Buddy Gant. They've, they've drawn first blood, but this is a 125-point game, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth in this game. 